Yes. All right. I am now going to introduce Darren Wolf. He is Eastern, former Eastern Vice Chair of the Libertarian Party of Pennsylvania and a blogger at the International Libertarian blogspot.com. He was our guest speaker of the year last year. Um, if you don't know him by now, then you don't come to our meetings. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> no, Darren, Darren, we had him so many times last year because he always gives a good presentation no matter what. Darren who? Darren Wolf. I, I said that, right? He's my husband. He just has to. No, yeah, he's not a heckler. He, uh, he is, but that's Steve's brother. It's don't his hold job. Me yeah. All right. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry, we got Okay, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Steve and Jane, and even thank you, Adam. <laughs> okay, Citizens for Liberty's members and guests, you know, the founders warned us against having a standing army among us. Now, they knew the threat to, to, to liberty that such a force posed. So tonight we're going to look at two main questions. <clears throat> First, how did they arrive at that conclusion and how do we apply these warnings today? Now, some uh, major works on liberty that were written in England and were widely printed and read in the colonies prior to the American Revolution were a series of essays known as Cato's Letters. Now, these are written by two British scholars by the name of John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon. These are written in 1722. Now before that, in 1697, Trenchard wrote a book titled, next slide please, there it is, an argument showing that a standing army is inconsistent with a free government and absolutely destructive to the constitution of the English monarchy. Now, in the book there were several warnings. If you go next slide please. The first one, right? No. Black up one. it. Let's blame that on the NSA again. Yeah, black, black up one. Right there. There we go. Thank you. All right. Now. All right. If we inquire how these unhappy nations have lost that precious jewel, liberty, we shall find their miseries proceed from this: that their necessities or indiscretion have permitted a standing army to be kept amongst them. Now, we need to put this in more modern terms. Obviously, things have changed a little bit since 1697. I would suggest this. Instead of thinking of standing army strictly in military terms, we think of it in terms of organized bodies of armed men. Whether we're going to call them armies or police or um, national guard, paramilitary, anything like that, the organized bodies of armed men. So the first point is kept amongst them. It's not that they were deployed overseas, not that they were uh, deployed to some far-flung frontier or kept in the barracks or on a post um, away from the people. They were among the people. Next slide, please. No nation ever preserved its liberty that maintained an army otherwise constituted within the seat of their government. So now we have the uh, organized bodies of armed men protecting the political power. Next slide, please. <coughs> There we go, the, the Israelites, Athenians, and all the rest of them. Uh, none of which nations, whilst they kept their liberty, were ever known to maintain any soldiers in constant pay within their cities. So now we're introducing another aspect to this, which is in constant pay. Today we would talk about that as full-time or career. So these, uh, these are people in the armed, uh, the organized bodies of armed men, they were not reservists, they were not part-timers, they were paid 100% by the government. So we don't have to wonder where their loyalty lay. It was with the person who's signing their check, or however they did it back then. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> it's the misfortune of all countries that they sometimes lie under an unhappy necessity to defend themselves by arms against the ambition of their governors and to fight for what is their own. For if a prince will rule us with a rod of iron and invade our laws and liberties, we must patiently submit to our bondage or stand upon our own defense, which if we are unable to do, we shall never be put upon it. And here we're getting to the, the, the really core aspect of this, which is often overlooked in modern debates about the uh, gun rights. If we are enabled to do, this is talk, 
<laughs> this, is, uh, this is talking about the institutional framework that needs to be in place. Obviously, governments will try to tyrannize, but if the people are the ones who are armed and organized to defend themselves, we shall never be put upon it. The government won't even try to tyrannize them. Also, the flip side of that coin is that if the government isn't armed to the teeth, and the people have the power, they won't try to tyrannize either. So those are two key aspects, I think, of the gun debate that's, that are not looked at very much today. And now after that, uh, John Trenter wrote another book in 1698 titled, next slide please, there we go, A Short History of Standing Armies in England. And from that we get the following warning. Okay, next slide please. Okay, I will venture to say that if this army does not make us slaves, we are the only people upon earth in such circumstances that ever escaped it. And if this army does not enslave us, it is barely because we have a virtuous prince that will not attempt it. And it is a most miserable thing to have no other security for our liberty than the will of a man, though the most just man living. For that is not free government where there is a good prince. Next slide, please. Okay, for even the most arbitrary governments have had sometimes a relaxation of their miseries. But where it is so constituted that no one can be a tyrant if he would. Cicero says, though a master does not tyrannize, yet it is a lamentable consideration that it is in his power to do so. And therefore such a power is to be trusted to none. Uh, which, if it does not find the tyrant, commonly makes one, and if not him, to be sure a successor. Can you back up, please? Yeah. Back up one slide. Okay. So some of this is a little obvious. Some of it, I think, needs to be uh, gone over a bit. Um, especially the part where he says, where to go? Ah, uh, the most miserable thing to have no other security for our liberty than the will of a man. He's saying this is not free government where you have, in other words, in, in modern English, it's not free government. We don't live in freedom if the government has the ability and the potential to tyrannize us, but for some reason chooses not to. This, that is, and this is what they're, this is what Trenchard is saying. That's not good enough. Next slide, please. Um, where he talks about the free government, where it is so constituted that no one can be a tyrant if he would. The most arbitrary governments, what he's talking about there is a government that's not limited, it's the, that can do as it pleases. When he talks about a relaxation of their miseries, he's talking about stopping tyrannizing. Again, for whatever their reasons, we don't know. He said the free government is one where you cannot be a, ty a tyrant, a leader cannot be a tyrant if that's what they wanted to do. He refers to Cicero, Marcus Tilius Cicero, the uh, Roman philosopher, statesman, lawyer from 2,000 years ago who saw the end of the Roman Republic. He said he issued that warning back then that we cannot trust power to anyone. A powerful government will attract to it tyranny-minded uh, leaders. Put that in quotation marks, leaders. Um, and it, if it gets good people into the government, they get tempted to use that power. And even if we get lucky and you get a good guy who doesn't tyrannize, what about the next one? He could be the tyrant. So he's saying, trust that power to no one. And now we can uh, fast forward to all of 1722, and we get to the Cato's letters that I mentioned earlier. I just wanted to focus specifically on number 95, and that was titled, Further Reasonings Against Standing Armies. If you can do the next slide, please. Oh, I forgot that slide. This is the cover of Cato's letters. Next slide after that. It is certain that all parts of Europe which are enslaved have been enslaved by armies, and it is absolutely impossible that any nation which keeps them amongst themselves can long preserve their liberties, nor can any nation perfectly lose their liberties who are without such guests. And yet, though all men see this, and at times confess it, yet all have joined in their terms to bring this heavy evil upon themselves and their country. 
So some of this is obvious. It, it, obvi the, the most obvious part is a government needs those organized bodies of armed men in order to tyrannize. You know, no, no people can lose their liberties if those organized bodies of armed men are not there. But the interesting part is everybody knows this, right? All men, what is it? All the all men see this, and uh, sometimes people even will say, "No, that's that's right, that's right, that's you know, can't have that, can't have that." But they always make up exceptions. There's always a reason to have these armed, uh, organized bodies of men among us. Whether it's you know, fighting a war, fighting crime, whatever it is, they, there's always an excuse, and we end up with tyranny. Well, <clears throat> how did all this affect the founders' thinking? Right. How did this affect the founders' thinking? Well, in his greatest speech, it is titled, Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? And actually, he was arguing uh, against adoption of the Constitution. The uh, anti-federalist, Patrick Henry, warned us. Next slide, please. It is on a supposition that your American governors shall be honest that all the good qualities of this government are founded, but its defective and imperfect construction puts it in their power to perpetrate the worst of mischiefs should they be bad men. And sir, would not all the world blame our distracted folly in resting our rights upon the contingency of our rulers being good or bad? Next slide, please. Show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were placed on the sole chance of their rulers being good men without a consequent loss of liberty. I say that the loss of that dearest privilege has ever followed with absolute certainty every such mad attempt. And that's where we ended up today. I guess that's why we're having this meeting. Next slide, please. Yes, sir. And I can quote James Madison, a standing military force with an overgrown executive will not long be safe companions to liberty. There's also Representative Jerry, another anti-federalist, uh, says during the uh, debates over the Second Amendment, what, sir, is the use of a militia? It is to prevent the establishment of a standing army, the bane of liberty. The warnings were there. Yeah, well, then now we know why the founders warned us against having a standing army. They knew such a force would be used to oppress. Today, the uh, standing army, if put that in quotation marks, that we have to worry about is the law enforcement establishment. Now, I'm not talking only about local and state police. I'm talking about federal agencies, too, like the Internal Revenue Service, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the Transportation Security Administration, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and let's just say ad nauseum. IRS. <laughs> I, yes, IRS. I, I'm not going to forget them. Now, rather than deploy troops on the streets, they use law enforcement to control us. And that brings me to right here, this book. I can't see it. Okay. Right here, this book, Hot Off the Presses. It's written by a man named Radley Balco, and it is The Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces. In this book, he documents 16 ways from Sunday what's going wrong. He talks about the court cases. He talks about the, um, the, the arming of the police, the financing of the police, uh, the growth of uh, police power. To put it, to make the long story kind of short, let me put it this way. <clears throat> For, it's been, I guess, uh, centuries now, we have the courts chipping away at our rights. The Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, all of that chipping away. Also, <clears throat> for decades now, there have been federal programs in place to share military hardware with law enforcement. We're talking about weapons of war, and we're talking about vehicles of war. Uh, this is part of what has led to the proliferation of SWAT, uh, Special Weapons and Tactics, which I found out in the book, originally they wanted to call them Special Weapons Attack Teams. Anyways, um, there, there are also programs in place, uh, burn grants, things like that, that finance 
SWAT teams at the local and state level so that they're not dependent on the local taxpayers. There's also civil asset forfeiture where the police can seize assets of people that they just declare to be drug dealers. No trial necessary, just take it, you know. And so these, these uh, SWAT teams can become very unaccountable. And we've gotten to the point where there are 50,000 SWAT raids every year in the United States. 50,000 SWAT raids every year. They're using SWAT teams to just do warrants, uh, serve warrants on pot growers, uh, things like this. Uh, they've raided uh, people that are doing raw milk on farms. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. I think there was, a, there was a famous raid, I think, in California. They raided somebody over a student loan. Um, I don't know. You didn't hear about that? <laughs> yes, so there was somebody they owed a student loan. So. The yeah, Obamacare included student loans in it. When they passed the Obamacare bill, part of it was the student loan system. Oh, okay. Okay. Controlled by the IRS. All right. How about that guy who used the wrong kind of wood from the rainforest for his violin bows? Remember that one? They came in and they shut him down, took his dog away and everything. Yeah, there's a, there's a, if you want to look it up, there's a, there's a video that went viral of a, uh, a SWAT raid in Columbia, Missouri, if I remember right. Uh, if you just Google that or go to YouTube and search it, it it's really terrible. They're actually at the wrong house or something, or they, an informant had lied about somebody being a drug dealer, and they went in and they shot the dogs. There were two children in the house who were scared witless, let's say. Uh, it's, it's just horrible just to, to watch this. Anyways, um, so we get uh, 50,000 SWAT raids every year. Other aspects of the police state that we have going on are checkpoints, which abound. Uh, some people think, oh, well, they're down there by the border. No, we have them here in Pennsylvania, too. Um, the IRS can audit us on a whim. And it is you. You're being audited. That's it. What happened to the Fourth Amendment? I don't know. Uh, police can stop and frisk us whenever they want. They can actually even enter our houses and businesses at will. Some people think that they need warrants and all that, but they can make up a million excuses. They'll go into your house, they'll go into your business. Uh, regulators can do inspections at will um, at any business they want. You know, it's, that's the whole problem. These, while these agencies exist, our liberties will always be in danger. There's no way that we can control them. They control us. Now again, I'd like to go back to Patrick Henry, so next slide, please. This is from the same speech, Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? Uh, did you ever read of any revolution in a nation brought about by the punishment of those in power, inflicted by those who had no power at all? You read of a riot act in a country which is called the freest in the world, where a few, a few neighbors cannot assemble without the risk of being shot by a hired soldiery, the engines of despotism. We may see such an act in America. A standing army we shall have also to execute the execrable commands of tyranny. And how are you to punish them? Will you order them to be punished? Who shall obey these orders? And that's exactly the situation we're in now. This is truly prophetic. It's like he knew that the police can pretty much do what they want to anybody, and there's no way to punish them. We can't stand up to the law enforcement establishment, much less the military. There's a big imbalance in power between the power of the government and the power of the people. Not only the military, but the law enforcement establishments here are overwhelmingly strong. So what we need to do is we need to start shifting that power away from the government by putting these functions back in the hands of the people where they belong. Now, one of the lesser known founders, he's uh, actually another of the anti-federalists, by the name of Tench Cox, he explained it very well. Next slide, please. Who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Is it feared then that we shall turn our arms, each man, against his own bosom? Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust in God, it will ever remain in the hands of the people. Now that one I don't think needs much explanation. We need to have that power. There's only one way to guarantee our lives and liberties, and that is to be stronger than the people who want to take them are. 
Now, a key point here is that the source of the problem is not the NDAA or the Patriot Act or the laws that created the war on drugs. These are merely the symptoms. The problem is that the government has the power to enforce these bad laws. Once it had the power, it then passed the laws. Now, the only way to be sure that we're not going to see a repeat of these repressive laws is to take that power away from the government. Now, one thing we got to do is we basically have to abolish policing as we know it today. We uh, need to move to a system of private security. There's no need for local police. History has already proved that private security is better at protecting us than the government is. A shining example comes from a place called Oro Valley, Arizona. Back in 1975, they hired a company called Rural Metro to be their police department. And they were providing the services that had been provided by the county sheriff. Crime rates were greatly reduced at a fraction of the cost of a government police force. Now, there is no need for national level law enforcement, that's for sure. Agencies, like I mentioned before, IRS, TSA, ATF, uh, ad nauseum again, uh, these are mostly, these are instruments of oppression enforcing mostly unconstitutional laws. What comes to mind is Thomas Jefferson's warning about an overly powerful and distant capital. Well, actually, it's pretty. It's actually pretty simple. When all government, foreign, when all government, domestic and foreign, in little as in great things, shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power, it will render powerless the checks provided of one government on another, and will become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we separated. That's what it says. I don't know where it went. Uh, it's, well, anyway, it's it. uh, no, go. Go, uh, stay there. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, um, where was it? Oh, not only is private security better at protecting people and their property, they have a provider-client relationship with them. Now, under this scenario, there's no incentive to enforce anything like the Patriot Act or the NDAA or the war on drugs, and the government wouldn't have the means to do so. Now, policing as we know it today got started around the mid-19th century. One of the things that, uh, in the book, uh, The Rise of the Warrior Cop there, one of the things that is speculated on, no, let me correct myself, it was an article that he wrote, the Bradley Balco wrote, where he said, his view is that the founders would not have, have liked the introduction of police forces the way we have them, that they would have seen it as the standing army that they warned about. But anyways, um, back then when they introduced police forces, they really weren't about preventing crime because crime rates were pretty low back then. It, w it was about expanding the government's power. Now if we fast forward to today, we see that the greatest threat to our lives, liberty, and property is the government. And this is due to their tremendous police power. The only way we're going to restore our rights is to take that power away from the government. Now, <laughs> It wouldn't do to talk about the police state without talking about the great enabler and a legitimizer of what they do, the courts. I mentioned before, it's been centuries now that they're just chipping away at our rights. Uh, court procedures are just out of control. And I know from uh, not just my, not merely my experience, but the experience I've seen of activists who have been arrested is that the courts basically do the bidding of law enforcement. They, they, it's weird, they're supposed to be controlling law enforcement, but it seems to be the other way around. Now, a great way to illustrate some of what's wrong is with a court case that was in the news recently, the George Zimmerman trial. So, the case was actually so named that the gun-hating, liberal, Harvard Law School professor, Alan Dershowitz, is actually calling for the prosecutors to be disbarred for the way they got, for, 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 for the, way they, uh, got the indictments. They actually withheld the pictures of Zimmerman's injuries. Dershowitz is saying, <laughs> that just cracked me up when I heard that, Dershowitz is the one saying that these guys need to be disbarred. Um, he says that there should be a Department of Justice investigation of the prosecutors for violating Zimmerman's rights. 
This is how lame that case was. Now, let's go to the video. We're going to see one minute of the prosecution's rebuttal to the defense's closing. Let's see here. If you get back there and you don't like some of the witnesses in the case, you don't like Rachel Gentel or Shipping Bow or the fact that there isn't this evidence or the fact that there isn't that evidence, ask yourself, who produced this trial? Who made up the witness list? Who created the evidence? Who chose the circumstances? Who chose the lighting? Who chose the time? Who chose the weather conditions? It wasn't me. It was the defendant. He chose everything. And that's why we're here. And that's why the evidence is what it is. But it is enough with your common sense. It is enough. And I'm not asking you to fill gaps. I'm asking you to do what you do every day. Start from the beginning. Get to the end. And apply your common sense. Okay, so there's the prosecutor by the name of John Guy telling the jury that they don't have evidence, they don't have credible witnesses, but convict them anyways. You know, why even bother to have a jury? Just let the prosecutor pick who gets locked up and who doesn't. Uh, now fortunately, in this case, it didn't work. But this is business as usual in the court system these days. People get convicted on, on nothing. And that's, uh, that's the enabling that I was mentioning before. Now, another issue that comes up with George Zimmerman here is double jeopardy. This is when somebody is, um, well, you can go back to the slides if you want. This is when somebody is put on trial twice for the same act. This is something that the, uh, the, uh, the founders saw the, uh, the British doing where they wanted to lock somebody up. So they put them on trial. Not guilty. They put them on trial again. Not guilty. They put him on trial again, guilty, uh, okay, now we can lock him up. The founders saw this and said no. And if I remember right, it's in the Fifth Amendment? Yes, okay, the Fifth Amendment, I have to turn to the expert here. <laughs> in the Fifth Amendment, no double jeopardy. So, now, the courts may not see it this way, but it seems to me if somebody is put on trial twice for the same act, it's double jeopardy. I don't care about it's you know, the state courts versus the federal courts, which is the excuse they try to use. It's only tried once in this level and not, not once on that level. They say, oh, well, that's okay. But as far as I'm concerned, um, if they charge George Zimmerman at the federal level, it'll be double jeopardy. The final line here is that the police state can't function without the courts to enable and legitimize it. Well, let me close by going back for a minute Two. Yeah, that's it right there. Okay. I think so. That's been in there twice. Let me go back to Trenchard's book, an argument showing that a standing army is inconsistent with a free government. If you go to the next slide, please. Yes, this subject is so self-evident that I'm almost ashamed to prove it. For if we look through the world, we shall find in no country liberty and an army stand together. So that to know whether a people are free or slaves, it is necessary only to ask whether there is an army kept amongst them. So to put it in modern terms, his argument is that if the institutions of a police state are in place, we have a police state. That's it. Let's stop kidding ourselves that we live in liberty here. We have a massive, militarized, law enforcement establishment among us. That's all the proof we need that we live under a police state. Thank you. Okay, our little huddle was about taking questions. Yes. Big thing, uh, I, like, I have a lawyer in my family, and most he says with the, with the courts about why they're not following the Constitution is they're not going by the Constitution, they're going by precedent. So they're going by on, on past cases. So if you have, just say you're a, a candy shop owner and you're a competitor with the court and he lost his case for, it, for selling this kind of candy, well, you, you try selling that candy, it's legal, but if you go to court, but since your competitor got, got 
taken away for his business practices, you'll be taken away because, or you'll, you'll be found guilty because of the, the past case that that he was found guilty of. So it's that, that's what the courts are going by. It's not by constitution. It's by precedence of past cases. So I'll put that out there. I'll address that. Yeah, that, that's a good point. That's that. Uh they'll do that. Uh, but I think that just briefly, yes, I do think a lot of it is case law builds on case law to basically render the Constitution irrelevant. Yes? If the people of this nation ever do get together to overthrow a tyrannical government, do you believe that our military would fire on the people? That's a good question. Okay, so the, the question was, just to be sure everybody heard, if, uh, if we ever do try to overturn a tyrannical government, do I believe that the military will fire on the people? Well, it's, obviously there's no way to know for sure. The, the, when you ask that question, sir, the one thing that comes to mind was Poland in the early 80s, when solidarity, the Union solidarity was, um, was uh, striking, and they, they, they thought that they were friends with the military over there. You know, they were, they, they were on friendly terms, but when the orders came down to fire, the military fired on them. Um, I do think that they would. I think you have to, you have to look at, the orders are not gonna be, okay, you know, soldiers, go massacre these civilians. The orders are gonna be, there's terrorists over there. They, they're, you know, they, they can deceive the uh, military too. Um, just like sometimes they talk about uh, the law enforcement people that say they're not gonna take, uh, take our guns. They're not gonna confiscate our guns. And yes, I believe them when they say, if orders come down, go around the neighborhood confiscating guns, they won't do it. But when the orders come down and say, well, there's suspicion of child abuse in that house, go in there and get those guns from those people and all that, they'll do it. Even if it's total, total, a total lie, a fabrication to get in that, to that house and take that person's guns. Waco. Uh, there you go. Kent State. Yes. Just wanted to make a quick comment. Remember Kent State? Ohio. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of too. Well, what I'm saying is, uh, there there are incidents like that where they, they were national Ohio National Guard, yep. but they but they fired on uh, unarmed students. Yep. Yes, Kent State, and around the same time, uh, Jackson State. There were two killed um, down in Mississippi under somewhat similar circumstances. I understand. So yes, they have fired on us already. Um, and how many people did the police kill? The law enforcement. How many people do they kill every uh, every year? Well, we don't really know. The FBI compiles all kinds of crime statistics, but they won't compile statistics about police abuse and how many people the police kill or anything like that. Yes? Interesting, the FBI won't uh, keep statistics on missing children. 800,000 children go missing in America each year. The FBI okay. doesn't keep statistics on it. Could it be George Bush? I'm talking the older George Bush and his pedophile Satanist friends. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. He, what he said was that the uh, the FBI doesn't to compile statistics on missing children. I, I something to look up. It. Something to look up. Yes. Any other questions? Um, yes. You mentioned the courts and the judges. Can't we hold them accountable and start writing the judges? I guess it's the um, the Constitution to our laws. We got to start with the judges, I think, because they're the ones who sentence us and, and all that. So, so the question: What laws we have going into Congress or trying to get it passed or whatever? Maybe we go after the judges. Print in the paper whatever case they rule is unconstitutional. Just let people know that what's going on. Now. So the, the question was basically how to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Try to embarrass them or something, make them accountable. Right. Get their names in print. Okay, let me, all right, let me just sum up. The question was um, uh, about keeping judges accountable and how could we do it? My view on that is actually pretty strong because I, um, I was involved with an active in, in the case of an activist who was arrested in Allentown in the name of George Donnelly. Some of you may know him. 
And uh, yes, he was hand he was part of a, uh, a group of three guys who were handing out flyers about jury nullification, and he actually was holding a camera. He wasn't handing out flyers. Uh, the thing was, when the uh, court security officers tried to take his camera, he held on to it, and then they charged him with assault for hanging on to his own camera. Nonsense like this. Um, but the, 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 the U.S. Marshal put forward a signed, sworn affidavit saying that certain things happened, and they're charging him with assault. Well, they withdrew those charges, and they filed some other charges, which were lesser ones, and the same U.S. Marshal puts, puts out a sworn affidavit with a whole different set of facts. And the judge, okay, no problem. Uh, my opinion there is this. The judges and the prosecutors depend on the law enforcement side for their protection. And the last thing they want is, of course, for these law enforcement guys to turn against them. And they know it. So their cush jobs depend on them keeping the system going the way it is. So they're not accountable to us. They're actually more accountable to law enforcement than anything else. And uh, not only that, but we have to pay taxes, whether we like it or not, really. And as long as they can keep taking money from us, they can keep doing what they want to do. So there's another issue to, to look into. All right, uh, just one more, yay. Okay, somebody gets one more question. Yes, sir. Just a statement. I think there's been an evolution. They all saw the bad press that, you know, Kurt Waco, Ruby Ridge. Uh, you can see with the Obama administration with the last couple uh, political campaigns, they're, they're taking the, 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 uh, uh, the lessons learned in marketing. They're employing some of the best psychiatrists, uh, marketing people. They're shaping the way the general populace feels. Liberal used to be a bad word, and they've turned that around that Tea Party is radical, extreme. I mean, I've heard the average person just hears this a couple times. They don't know, really know the insight. So they shape the opinion, as you said. They're terrorists. They're extremists. Then it doesn't look so bad. It doesn't look like you know Waco didn't play out that well. Even the average person said it was a horrific mistake, at least even if it was somewhat justified. But th there's an insidious here, this year that you have to consider, and it necessarily won't be published on the six o'clock news. So you know, we you know where mainstream media is coming down. Yes, and you know, uh, just a quick comment there, because there wasn't really a question there. Um, if you really want to see about uh, how that kind of thing works, you can go to the granddaddy of, uh, of them all. It's a man named Edward Bernays, who in 1928 wrote a, an essay called Propaganda. And back in those days, the word propaganda wasn't actually seen as a negative thing. He did actually write one chapter in that essay about political propaganda. And it's just amazing. It's, it's like he, he says democracy has, can, can only work if the, basically the government is leading the people and forming their opinions. It's not that the, the people is supposed to control the government. He actually came out and said, no, the government has to control the people. It's got to use propaganda, education, and all of that to shape the people's thinking, not the other way around. And with that, I think I've been cut off. So thank you. I hope you uh, learned from my talk. All right. Sorry about that, guys. I know anybody wants to ask Darren any more questions, feel free to hang around afterwards.